Real quick, just want to uh, a few thank yous before you guys hit me with the questions. Um, you know, I want to thank Terry and Kim again for giving us a chance just to compete for a championship. Obviously, we, we didn't – I wish we weren't here today. I wish this was weeks down the line. But uh, they gave us everything we needed. And uh, I want to thank our, our players. Um, these guys laid it on the line. And we'll get into it. Obviously, there were points of the season where we were counted out and these guys just wouldn't give in, um, even to the last you know snap of the game the other night. Uh, I want to thank our coaches. Um, I don't think anybody realizes the time and – Energy it takes to get this job done uh, from a coaching standpoint. It's very competitive. Yes, you have to have good players, but uh, you better have good coaching and putting them in the right situations. And, and um, while not every call is going to be perfect, I thought our guys, you know, really worked hard to, to give ourselves the best opportunity. Uh, our support staff, football staff, the, the medical team, the trainers, our football ops, equipment guys, uh, you know, the various conditions of, of the weather down the stretch and even just a different feel of the field this week versus the, the previous week. Uh, and, and then lastly, um, you know, I want to thank all the people that helped us pull these two games off at home. You guys were all here. You know the conditions we were in. Uh, our fans for trudging through, you know, all the snow uh, just to get to their seat, the Pittsburgh game. And then this past week, all the volunteers, um, our, all of our ground staff, um, you know, Aaron Rommel and his crew, Andy Major, uh, Josh D. I mean, just uh, it took a lot of people, a lot more than you would normally have to do to pull this game off and, uh, and to make it, you know, as positive for our players and our team and give us the best chance. So I know that was long, but I'd just uh, be remiss if I didn't thank all those people. So what would you say to people who are wondering if the window is closed on this team based off of how it ended and the salary cap stuff you guys face? Yeah, I mean, I don't get into that windows closed mindset. Um, you're always – your team is always changing and evolving uh, each, each class with draft classes, free agents, whether they're one-year deals or, or multi-year deals. Um, some guys age out. Some guys play themselves to where you can't afford them. So you're, you're constantly changing the roster. Um, but this is a quarterback league, and I believe in the guy we got in center – under center – and again, you you look at you know I know you know Joe Burrow and since he got hurt this year probably hurt their chances, but you know look at who's playing in the conference championship Lamar, you know versus Mahomes and um, Josh has played in that game. Obviously we've come up short. Um, you know we wish we were still playing, but uh, it starts there. We got other players that have to help. He can't do it by himself. Um, but I don't subscribe to the window is closing or is closed. Uh, but every team is a new team, and um, sometimes a team clicks at different parts of the year. I think we had to figure out who we were, what we did best, and luckily we did it in time to secure another division and give ourselves two home games. Does it feel like, uh, does it feel like uh, there's a sense of maybe a little frustration that there's – three years in a row now here to the, to the divisional round that there's almost this plateau that you kind of can't get past. And, and if so, you know, what's got to flip to, to get past that plateau? Yeah, I mean, Jay, it's a great question. Um, there's, no, there's no perfect solution here. You, you have to keep working. You have to learn um, every year. And you're constantly making decisions off of what you learn. Learn about yourself, learn about certain players, learn about situations in games. Um, experiences, but you know, the Chiefs was it five, six years in a row been in the in the AFC Championship. Like um, they're not going anywhere either. Um, I just mentioned Cincinnati, Baltimore's number one seed. Like the AFC, and I could name some other teams. I mean, in our own division, Miami. It took us to the last week to beat them on the road to to get the division back. Uh, they're not going anywhere. Um, you know. The Jets, um, you know, New England will be back. You know, there's a lot of teams in the AFC. So not everybody can make it. And we're going to keep fighting, but I can't sit up here and guarantee you, oh, yes, we have this magic answer and now we're going to the AFC Championship next year or we're going to the Super Bowl. But I can tell you we know what it takes. We do. Um, we have to execute. And when you lose games the way we – you know, 
I don't even think we – what did we lose? Was our worst loss this year by like six or seven points? Six. So when you lose – unless you're getting blown out, when you lose a game, a one-score game, you really can narrow it down to three, four, five plays in a game. They made, you didn't. And you have to make those. I'll take our team for as many things as went wrong. Um, we didn't play our best game defensively the other night. It wasn't, it wasn't our best outing. And there's, you can go through all the, the reasons why or why not. Uh, first, you have to give Kansas City credit. That's, that's a, a proven team that you know when, when it's gut check time, they've proven that they can make a lot of plays and they're going to be hard to deal with with Mahomes, Andy Reid, Kelsey, that whole crew. So you got to give them credit. Um, were there some plays we like back? Yes. Um, but we had the ball with, at the two-minute warning in field goal range to tie with a chance to take the lead. Uh, we were right there. So while we're extremely disappointed, I'm, nobody's more disappointed than me, I'm also not going to just throw the whole season out and say, let's tear this thing up and start over. And we will be in that situation again. And you hope with experience and time on task and, that, and more, more opportunities that those three to five plays that I was talking about will make them and will advance to that next level. I think any, to, just to follow on that, I don't think anyone is suggesting starting over, but you know, 22 unrestricted free agents, uh, uh, on paper salary cap situation that looks pretty bad. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a, a forced start over in some ways just because of those things. So regarding the cap, I mean, is the situation as bad as it looks? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not, we don't have, you know, the same money we had going into 2019, tw you know, in 2020. Um, but we will we'll work around it. You know, we're not planning to take a year off and just, um, not be competitive. Will we be younger in some areas? Yes. Will we have to rely on draft picks? Maybe we don't have, you know, maybe we're not able to keep 5D tackles that we feel can play this year. Or maybe there's some positions, you know, we've always tried to create as much depth as we could for what we saw. We had to play with some depth down the stretch. Um, Sometimes when you're trying to work your cap and, and when you're paying a quarterback up here and, and we've definitely been aggressive on some pieces the last couple of years, that's not going to be an option, Jay, to your question. Um, but I don't think – I'm not laying my head down tonight going, we don't have a shot at it next year. Hey, Brandon, I, you, you mentioned the free agents. We've got 22. Part of the reason is you signed a lot of those guys to just the one-year deals. <laughs> yeah. Is that just the way you're going to have to make a living right now because of your salary cap situation? You've just got to, you've got to do these lesser one-year deals to get by? Yeah, that's, that's one of the strategies and, um, that we'll have to do. You know, we, we do have, you know, I think when we get a comp pick, I think we're going to be at 10 draft picks. We're going to need, you know, a good port. You know, we need to hit this draft. And um, we need to hit every draft because we've talked about it all along. If you, if you don't draft well, you know, when you get in this cap situation that Jay was asking me about, um, then it really shows. You're, and I think we had young players playing this year, whether it was their first year in the team or their, you know, an A.J. Epinesa was his fourth year. Like, we still got to get those guys. And we may have to count on, you know, maybe we didn't have to count on an A.J. as much. You know, we were a little deeper. We had more cap space. A guy like that may have to – be more accountable and play sooner and be counted on. And so there will be some situations like that. The one-year deals, yes, we'll, we'll have to do some of that. We'll have to be selective. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think we will sell the fact that this is, you know, a team that's, that's gotten to where we've got, not, not all the way where we want, but it's a competitive team. And when it's close, you know, I, I feel like people – you know, Josh Allen and, and what we've done here will be an attractive option if they're not, you know, people are going to chase the money. But if you're not getting up here, I think there will be some options, and that's how we got some of the one-year deals done a year ago. We talked about the defensive line. We talked about the defensive line being a big problem after the Cincy loss last year, and we're kind of having that same conversation again this year. Um, Von Miller, how do you 
see what he did this season and have the confidence. And I know you're kind of that the contract kind of puts you in a place where you, he, he'll likely be back. But how can you rely on him knowing what he did wasn't able to produce this year? Yeah, I mean, um, unfortunately, an ACL. We you know it's kind of two years in a row we've had a key guy get hurt on Thanksgiving. That's you're getting him back the next year and and wasn't the Von Miller that he wanted to be, you know, for a good portion of this year. I think it was trending up as the year, you know, as the year went on. Thought he, you know, actually made some good plays in the run game the other night more than pass rush opportunities presented itself. But you saw that explosiveness coming back. Um, and that's that should only improve according to our medical team. Um, you know, until you get out here and do it, you know, no, you know, we can all predict, but um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's unfortunate that, you know, the guy that was, that was playing a year ago before he got hurt on Thanksgiving, I think he was top 10 in, in sacks and had made some big plays for us um, to help secure a game in Kansas City, some other sacks, you know, the Rams game. Um, that's what you would have loved to have had this year, but, and, and nobody wanted that more than Vaughn. And he, he tried, uh, he just, wasn't all firing at all times for him, but I do think it was trending up. What's your take on where Stefan Diggs is at right now in terms of the tapering of his production? We've seen some drops, that, that type of thing. Where his game stands is this season? Steph's an, he's a number one receiver. Um, you know, it's, I firmly believe that, that. I'm not wavering off of that. I still, I think teams, listen, we have to continue to put weapons out there to keep teams from bracketing him or, you know, locking him down in different ways to take him away. They, they know you're going to want him. You, you know, so Steph can still play. I'm sure he would love to have that, you know, that deep ball again. He'd be the first to tell you he's super competitive. He's going to work his tail off this off season. And, and, you know, that's, I don't, I know there's various reasons or, questions on this or his production, all that, but um, I still see Steph as a number one receiver. Brandon, you talked about, talk uh, about when you look at <coughs> the criticism that was leveled at Sean, um, whether that was fair or not, how do you, now that you have a full body of work of a season, how do you rate the job that he did? Um, and keeping in mind that you were six and seven in one score game. Um, when you say criticism, criticism as a, as the head coach, as on the defense, what, what were you um, referring criticism to? Criticism coming from the fan base. There was, there was a numerous number of people um, back in midseason when I think you were 5-5 five and five, mm -hmm. that were calling for Sean to be fired. Okay. Um, and there was obviously something that Sean wanted to address with us over comments that he made, mm -hmm. uh, which he regretted. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you rate the job that he did now that you have a full picture of it um, while also knowing without that criticism of fair or not while also noting that he you are six and seven in one score games yeah I mean again those come down to a play here or there there's there wasn't anything in those games where you're going man he really botched this or he botched that um, there's a, you have to look at the whole picture of those things um, I think Sean did a really good job and I think if he hadn't have done a good job or, the, or he had lost this team, I think when that stuff came out that you were talking about, you know, I think I spoke to you guys and I said, we'll find out the, the character of this team and, and really, you know, how much they believe in their head coach. And, you know, we, we won every game until, until we lost uh, on Sunday here. And when you add on the added responsibility of the defensive coordinator, um, I mean, he already put a lot of hours into this thing. He, you know, something tell him to get out of here. Like he's got to get a break for himself. I thought he did a really nice job. You know, there was questions on that. Like, can he? He's been this head coach. Can he wear both hats? And I thought he did a really nice job. I thought, um, you know, with some of the injuries we had down the stretch. You know, I thought he found the right pieces to generate pressure or cover up some holes on the back end, you know, where we were playing with some more depth players versus starters. Um, 
you know, like anything, I'm sure there's plays or calls in a, in a game or a decision here or there. You're never going to bat a 1,000 on those. Um, but, you know, we're not sitting in here in this building going, man, um, I don't think Sean McDermott can, can do the job. Brandon, you talked this? about the wide receiver position around Diggs and putting guys around him. Brand, uh, Sean talked about explosive plays. You've talked about speed. Do you need more of that on that position? Do you need more of that on this team? We, we'd take it. Um, we're, we're always looking for it. Um, you know, we signed a futures guy in K.J. Hamler who's had some injury bug, you know, issues, but uh, was an explosive player at Penn State and early in Denver before some injury things caught up with him. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's why we added a Hardy and, and guys like that. You know, you're always looking to add speed because – you, you're you're widening the field. You're you're pulling guys out there. They've got to they got to defend it. I mean, obviously you look down in Miami, how much space they play with because you got Hill and Waddle and, and even their their backs with a lot of speed. So uh, you would love to have a track team of speed, um, but you still got to make sure they're football players, Mike. Too. You know what I mean? You can't just um, it's not just track and field. But yes. We're always looking for speed on both sides of the field, not just at receiver. Brandon, as early, or, as early as you are in the process for the draft, is this, is this a top 100 or a top four rounds where you can find immediate starters on defense? I think we will. I mean, it is, it is early, um, so I, I don't want to totally say, yes, we got this. I think, um, you know, I, I've done a decent amount, but a lot to do, including heading to the Senior Bowl next week and then – uh, we'll sit in here for two weeks with our scouts before the combine, and ask me at the combine. I can probably tell you a lot, you know, a lot more than I could today. This is a wide right receiver draft, and you know, Kansas City was daring you guys to throw one on one with Sherfield on that other side. Could connect there. Now, will that be a point of emphasis of getting Stephon Diggs some help as a number one receiver, a bona fide two that can take that pressure off of Diggs? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, again, we're always looking for various players, uh, whether it was – we're always looking for mismatches. And I said that when we drafted Dalton, um, you know, when we brought Cook here, you know, trying to find various mismatches. So, yes, any guy that um, causes the defense that you can put them in a look and get them in a – you know, where you can dictate to them. And if that's, you know, another receiver to offset Steph or, or whoever else, yes, we would um, – we wouldn't hesitate to do that, Mookie. How do, you, how do you feel the offense operating with both Dalton and Dawson on the field together? And where do you envision that going now with a full year under, under their belt together? Yeah, I mean, I think I think those guys did a great job. I, you know, I give a lot of credit to Dawson. Um, it's probably not easy when you've had your the play time here, you know, and, and all the plays he's made for us to draft a guy in the first round, you know, we're all human. Your first thing is probably, what, what does this mean for me? And, and, you know, I commend Dawson. He is such a selfless player. We were talking about earlier, he, he, he made a comment to, um, I think it was Rob Boris, like, if you need me to block, I, I want to help, I can do more, you know, but if you need me to block every play and it's going to get us a Super Bowl, that's what I'm willing to do. And so um, I want to give him a lot of credit for that. And you saw him, I think part of, Dalton is a great player. You know, he's already a pro to be a rookie. Uh, and But you just saw Dawson pouring into him, and I think it helped both of them. So I think they will continue to help each other. I don't think they have the same skill set. Um, I think, you know, Dawson is a, is a unique player in that he's got some straight line speed, yet he's also a gritty, tough blocker. He adds an element of physicality. Um, Dalton tries to play physical. He's just – He's not as, as developed physically and, and lacks the play strength that Dawson plays with. But uh, I would see both those guys helping us going forward. And, and again, given Joe, um, you know, various options, depending on who you're playing. You know, there's going to be some games where 12 personnel is better than 11 or maybe even 13 and maybe 21. So it'll be still a week-to-week -week thing how much we're in 12 versus 11. But – uh, we're going to need them both. I can ask you if uh, uh, you just mentioned kind of Joe in a, a future sense there. What was your uh, – obviously, Sean is working through all that right now, but um, do you feel confident that 
that there were, that he's an answer for this? Yeah, I thought Joe did a really good job. You know, we obviously have to go through that internally here, and, and we're working on, um, you know, all those internal things here between Sean and myself and, and, and Terry. Um, so we'll, we'll work through that. But, you know, it's, it's not easy mid-season because, like anything, if, if Brian Gain comes over and takes over – as a GM, he may like some of the things I do, but he may want to do a twist on a few things. Mid-season, that's kind of hard to do. It'd almost be like mid-draft. Terry fires me, hopefully he doesn't do it mid-draft. But um, mid-draft and then gain taken over, like, well, the board's been set. You're kind of just dealing with it. He, and so um, to do that mid-stream, I think, you know, I think Joe did a really good job and deserves serious consideration, you know, for this job. How much does an endorsement from Josh, which came yesterday in his end of season news conference, factor into? Oh, we don't care at all what Josh thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure he knows that too. <laughs> Last season going in, how do you help your quarterback evolve to be the ascending the elite quarterback he needs when the coordinator is inexperienced? We got the answer with that, with Dorsey not being around next year. How do you take that experience into saying, looking at Joe Brady's evaluation, will he be that guy that, you know, with that inexperience to get Josh over the hump? Josh's been playing for, what, six, seven years now. More seasoned coordinator or someone that can help guide him in certain moments? Do you think that would be a situation or that has that been a problem? No, I don't think I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think um, whether it's a 20-year ex-coordinator you know, or uh, and, and Joe has coordinated before. In fairness to Joe, um, whether it was at LSU or then at uh, at the Panthers, so it wasn't his first time, you know, calling plays or anything like that. It was his first time with Josh calling the plays, and like anything, that should continue to get better. But um, I really appreciated the communication that I saw between the two of those guys. The collaboration uh, that's important because. You know, Josh is the is the gunslinger back there, but he's also he's that he's that coordinator on the field. Joe can't get out there with him like he can in in Pop Warner and stand on the field and, and coach these guys up. He's got to do that just like you know your Mike linebacker does. Uh, you know, on defense. So um, I don't see anything that stood out to me from Joe's standpoint that he man. He's, he's not hitting Josh with this or that. Like, that that's going to be an issue. Hey, Brandon, you seen with Josh? A couple defensive linemen that are signed for next year. you got a bunch of guys that are ready to leave. Yeah. <laughs> How challenging is that? I mean, that's got to be the most challenging position you're going to have to look at in the offseason, isn't it? Yeah. it's. Uh, we definitely have some challenges. We do. And um, it's important that every dollar we spend, that we spend it wisely. And – that it's, it's not on a guy that uh, he didn't pan out. Because as I said, I don't, I don't know that we're going to be able to have some spare. You know what? Let's take two and a half million, take a shot on this guy. And if we put two and a half million, he better, he better help us win. And that's on me. And, and that's my job to, you know, to Sean and the coaches and, and, to, uh, and to Terry and Kim. Priority. Where's the priority? Where's the priority on Daquan while we're on the defensive line? Because <laughs> when healthy, he was so instrumental in what you did on that defensive line early in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you kind of project, if you can, or anything you could say about it, what his market's going to be like as he's kind of going to free agency? Yeah, I don't know what his market is is going to be like, but um, we missed Daquan. You know, when he got hurt in London, and and I told him as much yesterday. Like, just um, Daquan is a good player. Let's first, first and foremost, well, you guys all know that, a, a long-time starter in this league. Um, beyond that, he's a leader, and he's well-respected. Um, he, he makes others around him better. Um, and so, you know, you would want a Daquan Jones around. And, you know, we would love to get him back. It's got to be fair for him and fair for us. You know, he's reached free agency. I, I'll say that about any guy that's – anybody else you bring up, he's earned the right to test his market and see what it looks like. And um, But, yeah, we'd be a fool not to uh, entertain bringing him back. Brandon, you talk about spending money wisely. Do you feel like 
you were able to do that this past offseason, bringing in a number of free agents. Do you feel like you got a good enough return on that, on that crop of new players this year? You know, um, that's like evaluating myself, so I don't, you know, I'll let you guys decide that. I mean, I, I appreciate what the guys did, the guys we brought in. I thought, you know, those guys all balled in and, and for the most part was pleased with them, you know, to go through everyone and where they ranked and how they did. I, you know, I don't know if that's fair, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll need where we have to fill holes that we can't do in the draft. Um, we'll need to hit those, whether it's, you know, to Sal's question earlier, a one-year deal or, um, you know, whatever the situation is. Brandon, 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 it's fair, Brandon fair to say that um, I think um, are the projections fair that you're about 43 and a half over? <coughs> well, what's the cap? Um, not knowing what the cap might be, but yeah. and, but when you look at as much as you've already restructured con contracts and you hate doing that to begin with for kicking the pail down the road, mm -hmm. how much might you still have to do that this year um, knowing what, what lies ahead? Yeah, we'll still have to do that. I mean, I just think we're in that um, ever since the COVID year where the cap went backwards by $16 million, I don't know that that'll ever be recovered. You know, the cap was at 224 or whatever it was this year. It should have been at 240 at least, maybe 250. Instead of going backwards 16, it should have gone up 6 7%. Um, you guys can figure the math out. But um, that started this whole trend around the league, and especially with us, it jostled our planning. Um, and. I don't see us getting out of that anytime soon, you know, when you're paying a quarterback where you're paying them. And we've already had to do that just to be competitive these last few years. So um, I don't love it. You're right. But uh, we want to be competitive, and so we'll do what we have to do. Brandon, you, you the, mentioned uh, getting younger at some positions. Jordan's got one year left in his deal. Micah, uh, his deal is up. He told us yesterday he's going to take some time with the family. How do you see – those two guys in that position evolving? Yeah, I mean, first off, we just finished the last game of the year, and so we're going through all those evaluations. But, you know, I would just say I don't know that I've ever seen two safeties play seven seasons together. You know, and I, I know Micah's year got cut short last year a little bit. Um, but I just – I'm, you know, amazed at, at all they did. And for us – not only on the field, but the culture here and just every day. You're not going to find two better pros than that. And to, for two guys to be back there, um, what they did was, was amazing. You know, Micah is a free agent, so we'll see where his head is at. And, um, and Jordan has one year left. You know, we haven't gotten down the road as far as what we're going to do. And from that standpoint, I would just say, um, you know, if Micah retired or, or we couldn't afford to sign him if he played or something like that, you're, you would definitely, you know, miss that. There's, there's not somebody just going to walk in the door and be Micah Hyde or, you know, or, or Jordan Poirier or whoever. Brandon, how would, you, uh, how would you assess Gabe Davis this season? There seemed to be some frustration on his part. But I know, you know, the numbers weren't always there, hot and cold. But, you know, he was a team captain. I know the guys respect his work ethic. Where, where do you think things are with him? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll start with, I think I said this after his second year, but like that Gabe is just a relentless worker, almost too much. Um, he, I mean, he, you have to tell him to get away from it. And he, he deserves everything he's gotten, all the success he's had. Um, he believes in himself, and he sees himself as a guy that can do more and wants the opportunities. Like, they have to drag him off the field sometimes, and that's what you want. You don't want guys that you're like, dude, get out there and, and help us. He wants the ball. He wants opportunities. Um, like anything, I think there's probably games he felt he could have done more, the, some of the games where the stats were, whether it was targets or catches, whatever. Um, but he, he still made big, big plays for us. He helped us. Um, you know, I do think, you know, you know, we would have loved to. We were hopeful that we'd get him back. Should we have won that game this week? And I think he would have. He would have helped. So, um, Gabe's a good player in this league. Uh, whether you want to call him a, a number two or number whatever you want to call him, he's a good player. 
And, you know, he's earned the right, just like I said on Daquan, to see where his market's at. And, you know, we'd be a fool not to want him back. It has to work for him and it has to work for us. Clarify when you said, sorry, or just quickly to clarify, when you said he wants more, do you mean like he wants more from himself or he wants more from a role in a team? No, I think he wants to he wants to help. I mean, no different than my comment on Dawson Knox. Like, um, Gabe is a selfless guy, first off, similar to Dawson. But when you when you lose a game, you know, we, we went through a stretch where we lost these games by four, five, six, three, whatever. You're always going, man, I could have, like, if they'd throw me that ball when I was open or if they'd have done this, that's your natural thing. Like, I don't want to lose. I can do more. I can help this team. And so those games where maybe he had less targets or less catches, whatever happened, I think th there were times where, gosh, if you could have just got me the ball here, I could have made this play or given me the opportunity. Um, that's what I was – does that does that make sense? Yeah. With, um, with Tredavious White, as complex a situation as it is, injuries, having Russell and Christian Benford both under contract for next year, is that a situation where you need to weigh your options or do you believe he'll be on the roster in 2024? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we love Trey. Um, what I mean, guy worked – relentlessly hard on his rehab to come back from the ACL. And then, you know, we have this big win versus Miami at the end of the game, Popsy Achilles. Uh, he's attacked this the same way. And so I think for us, our focus here is just getting him healthy uh, more than anything else to get him back on the field. And we haven't gone down that road of what does our starting corners look like next year? Um, what you know? What can we afford? Anything like that? I do feel like we have some depth there, um, which helps. But uh, again, a healthy Trey White is is a heck of a talent. So um, you know, you would always want that if you if you can make it happen. How do you fear about Kyrus Elam? <coughs> Where did he fit going into next? I know he he dealt with injuries, but he definitely flashed. Coach McDermott mentioned that. What do you think the plan going forward with Kyrus Elam? Kyrus just got to you know guys develop at different paces. Um, I do think the foot deal bothered him more than he let anyone know, um, you know, at the at the end of training camp. And yes, he was playing with it, but he, I don't I don't think he looked like himself there, you know. And I think he was kind of just he wanted to win that job, and he wasn't really, you know, opening up how bad it was bothering him. And you know, I think the best thing we did was you know, let our medical team work on him and get him healthy. And, and I, th I think you saw flashes of what he can do. And, and I think there was even more plays that he'd be the first to take. I would, you know, I made that play, but I'd like to make another play. He was probably a little bit rusty. You know, you, you can't mimic games for as long as he was out. Um, but he's, he's a pro. He loves it. He works hard. He's in the building all the time. Uh, a little bit like Gabe in the sense probably sometimes we have to tell him to get away, like go do something else. And um, but he'll he'll come back compete. He has a good skill set, and you know we're not going to tell him you're starting or anything like that. But um, anything can be earned, you know that. And I know he'll put the work in this off season. Can change be a good thing for you guys? You know you for so long, certainly, but as an organization, had a lot of continuity, and continuity has gotten you to a point. But could change maybe get you over that point? I, I think you'd be a fool to say it couldn't. Um, I think you're always – you always have to evolve. You have to, your team has to evolve. How you do things has to evolve. You've always – I have to evolve as a general manager. Sean's got to evolve as a, as a head coach. Um, our organization has to evolve and, and find better ways to do things and, and how do we take the next steps. What are the little things? Because the winning in this league, I said earlier, that game – it might have even been three plays. Max five plays changes the outcome, and we're not sitting in here right now. And so you're always looking for those fine little advantages, and that's our job this offseason is to be truthful, be be real. Um, where are we good but not great? Okay, and if we're bad some area, if we're bad in some area, that's a no-brainer. But don't accept just being good. How do we make it great? And that's not always with the players you bring in, it's, it's support staff. Um, it could be a, a coaching change if, if that happens in, 
you know, a position, whatever, or guys leave. We got guys interviewing for coordinator positions on a couple of spots. So um, if you lose someone, it doesn't mean it's always the sky is falling. Sometimes change, change is going to happen, and you have to evolve with it. And I think sometimes change can be good. Going back, to, going back to Trey, and even I had a question about Matt Milano too, where are the two of them as far as their roads to recovery? Where are they in that point? Yeah, um, I didn't get a, a, an update here as of the last, you know, couple weeks just with our focus on the playoffs. Heather, so I would say um, both are improving, but I don't, you know, n neither one was going to be eligible to play, you know, in, in the, even if we had made it to the Super Bowl. So there's still time. But, you know, I I feel like Matt's probably closer to being through rehab than Trey the last time. But I don't know specific timelines or dates. We'll just – um, you know, they'll keep working here and, and until they're fully healthy and ready to roll. Brandon, in, in regards to the offensive coordinator search, um, one, can you clarify, do you need to, to hire, or excuse me, interview outside candidates in terms of maybe Rooney rule requirements or anything like that? And then just how extensive do you envision this search being, knowing what an important hire it is for the, for the organization? Yeah, I mean, every coach is, is, a, is an important hire, but no doubt um, the guy who's – um, or gal who's leading your offense, and, and especially with Sean being a, a defensive head coach, it's, uh, it, it is a very important hire and, and definitely have, have already, you know, started bef even before this conversations, as I said, you know, internally about that. Um, it, it's, you know, we, we've got to make sure it's right. You don't, you don't want to have to make a midseason change like we did this time. So um, you're always learning. You're always listening. And... We'll we'll do our due diligence here. It does, you know, to answer your the first part of your question. Yes, when you um, for the co coordinator and a quarterback coach, you you know if, if we hired for those like if if for the coordinator, yes, if Joe got the job and we took him out of the quarterback job, or if he took a coordinator job somewhere else, w there's rules on on that as well. Sunday wasn't your best game defensively. The last four years, the elimination <coughs> games have been four of the worst games defensively that you guys have played. What's your level of confidence that, that Sean can find an answer against these top quarterbacks that you're going to keep running with? Yeah, no, I, I've seen Sean go against them um, all the way back to our time in Carolina. He's gone against them. He was, like I said, we went 15 and one one year with him going against some very good quarterbacks. Um, he's he's done it here. Again, I'll say what I said earlier. You don't want to. You do put emphasis on it at the end of the year, but you don't want to overemphasize and and say well it's just that. You got to look at the total body of work, and for some of the you know depth concerns we had this year, just that we some guys we had to call on. As soon as having to call an AJ Klein, you know, back from you know living down in Charlotte, to a week later, you know, he plays a half and then has to start, you know, and, and there were other positions. Uh, I think you got to take all that into consideration each year. You know, I know last year the Cincinnati game, we weren't at full strength on our D line. They didn't they didn't play as well that game. This year they were, uh, but it was some other spots. You know. Um, I've seen Sean coach defense for 11, 12 years now, and uh, he knows what he's doing. And um, to me, there'd be no reason to make a change. Wait, you you assess, covered some of this how could you assess this team this year, and where do you feel that it needs to get better? How can I assess this team? Yeah. Um, you know, this team, as I told him yesterday in our exit, was resilient. and. The middle of the season, we hit a lull for various reasons. Uh, we we weren't playing complimentary football, but once we figured that out, uh, this team became dangerous. And there was nobody that we felt we can't we can't beat. Like oh, we you know we're gonna have to have four turnovers to win this game or anything like that. Um, but when you get in when you get into the playoffs, you have to be playing your best. 
And if you are not at your best for one game, this is not a you know NBA or Major League Baseball where it's a series. It's it's do or die, and uh, the AFC is it's loaded. It's not going anywhere, and it will be a hard road again next year to get to where we got. And I don't I don't want to lose sight of that and take it for granted. I'm uh, starting over. We'll see him back in the divisional round of the playoffs. No, it took everything we had to get into the playoffs to the last week and win the division, and it's going to be even harder next year. Again, you play the first place teams. Um, you've won whatever three, four divisions in a row. Like people know who the Buffalo Bills are, and we're going to get their best. Um, just like you know, I think that's part of why the Chiefs were 11 and six this year. They they've had all this success more than we've had. Um, and so they get people's best, and you got to be ready for it. I think Terrell Bernard was your most surprising player of the year, the way he ascended and took control of that job and played the way he did. Yeah, give a lot of credit to Terrell. Uh, I'd have to really sit here and think. was, But he, he was a guy that, you know, going back to the draft, you just felt maybe isn't going to be a tester, you know, to Mike's point earlier about speed and all that, may, I'm not saying he's slow. I'm just saying a, sometimes you have testers that are good in track, but they're not good football players. Uh, this guy is a football player first, and his instincts help him overcome, you know, if he's not as big or as fast as some other people. And the thing that don't truly know until they're in that position that I want to give him a lot of credit for, it's hard for a first-year guy uh, and I see he's a second-year player, but first-year starter, to go in there into that huddle. I said earlier he's the quarterback of the defense. It's hard to go in there and look at Vaughn Miller or Micah Hyde or Jordan Poyer and say, this is what we're doing. This is how you, like, lead that group. And you saw him transform into that role, and guys fed off of him. They wanted it. They, they encouraged him to do that. And so that's – like, he's going to come in in a totally different place this offseason. And everyone knows he's the quarterback of that defense. And so that's just going to – that's going to help our whole defense going into next year, whatever changes we have to make, having that position settled. Because you're right, it was unsettled with the departure of Tremaine. And, you know, this kid, you know, he wanted to play. So, like, the doctors told us – after the Pittsburgh game, like, you, you, can, you can count him out for the Chiefs game. And this kid kept saying, every day, I'm playing, I'm playing. You saw him running in the pools. And we go work him out the day before the game. And he – some of the things looked good. Some of it, he still struggled. And he got done and knew he couldn't do it. And just the tear I mean, the tears in his eyes, I, was just, I almost had tears in my eyes. And that's what gets you excited. And you got guys like him on your team, you're going to go a long way. And I had high respect for him, but this is a business, and sometimes guys make business decisions, and you understand and respect it. This guy was going to go out there and play on one leg and one foot if he had to, and, and we had to protect him from himself. As far as surprises go, how about Khalil Shakir this season? Uh, <coughs> Kind of a training camp maybe on the roster bubble from a lot of people's perspective. And then at the end of the season, really taking the bull by the horns as your number two receiver. Yeah, I don't I don't know where the roster bubble part came from. Um, that didn't come internally. It was never uh, on that internally. Um, Khalil's a guy that late last season, I think the coaches and, and Josh started feeling, man, you throw this guy the ball, he's dependable, he's going to be where he's supposed to be. That's just what he is. Um, he's one of those guys, he's sneaky fast. He ran the low four fours. When you watch it on film, um, you don't realize he's, he's covering the ground he is. At one point this season, he had the fastest time on our offense. Um, it was, I think it was, may have been that run he had against the Jets. But uh, he's, he can move. He's one of those guys, he's covering more territory than you, than you realize. And, and he's only going to get better. And I mean, some of the plays he made the other night, uh, he there were some guys that were trying to will this team, and I'm not going to go through them all, to victory, even though we were depleting some other areas. And he was one of those guys that he was laying it all on the line and just 
made some excellent plays to help keep a drive going or that whatever it was, third and 13, makes the, the touchdown catch there. So I know you had a question 100 times. You mentioned how you had to like bring in a guy like A.J. Klein to add depth to the defense, that sort of thing. Do you feel like there's anything you need to change or improve on to make sure the depth is there for like keeping the roster late in the season so you're not having to call on someone like that who's going on vacation to play the role that he had to play? Are you saying I did a bad job, Elena? Do you feel like there's anything you need to, you know, yeah. does it, do you learn anything from something like that? Well, you, you try and um, I always know that you're going to have injuries, okay? We're, and um, like I said, we took five D tackles into the year. There's some positions that we wanted more depth at, and linebacker was probably one of those we started because we wanted so much D line depth. Um, we also knew Vaughn was coming back that we probably went um, lighter let's just say, and, you know, sometimes that happens where you're lighter, you, you get injured quicker, and, and I don't know if that was coincidence or what. We just, uh, it was what it was. I mean, once you lose a Matt Milano for the season, everyone's, you know, their ask start ramping up, and so the probability suggests that. And, you know, TB, first time as a starter, did a great job all year. He, he gets banged up. Dodson played a bunch of games. Um, Specter had some soft tissue stuff, but you know we'll we're always going to try to have the depth as deep as we can. Again, we got to be able to fit it within you know the cap constraints, whether it's draft picks or, or signings. Randy, can you take us through your conversations with Sean as far as <coughs> what will happen with the defensive coordinator play caller position? He said obviously we're not getting the staff stuff yet. But from your perspective, kind of how does that take place? Is it, hey, whatever Sean feels is best? Is it your input? Kind of how does that all work? Yeah, I mean, uh, just like when we made the decision last year after, um, after Leslie uh, decided to take a year off, we talked about it internally, heard Sean out, like these are, these are my options, this is how I see it. And, but he, he felt strongly and when he – kind of presented that to Terry and I, we both were in lockstep. If we weren't, you know, we're going we're gonna to listen to him. And ultimately, Sean, you know, I think Terry and myself would both, you know, if he feels strongly about something, we'll give him input, yay or nay. But I think we'd, we would ultimately, if he feels he needs to put someone else to call the plays, we would do that. If he is like, man, yes, I can do this, I want to do it again, then – we would go that because I don't – there was nothing that left me saying he couldn't wear both hats. Confirm on Leslie, is he no longer under contract? He um, – it, it expires basically uh, coming up. So he he's not under contract going into the next season. Brandon, Sean referenced this. Um, and I remember this news conference after the AFC championship loss to the Chiefs. And coming out of that game, there was an obvious – you know, there was kind of a gap um, in terms of where they were and, and where you were as a team. And I know that pass rush became a priority and, and some moves spoke to that that followed. And, and listening to some of your comments, I'm just interested in your take. Has this roster and program evolved to a point? Do you see an area or element that's, that's missing? What's it going to take to to get over the top against whether it's the Chiefs or the other AFC? Can you pinpoint an area or... Have you evolved to a point where it's, it's close enough that it's a kind of a play here or there? That you yeah, I would, I would probably lean more to what you said there at the end that, you know, we got to be as strong as we can be in multiple areas. You got to have a quarterback. You got to protect him. I thought we, our O line, I thought this was the best group we had since we've been here, you know, as a group. And I thought Coach Chrome. And Austin Gunn did a heck of a job getting those guys working together because that that group, how they gel and work together is so important, you know, probably of any group. And um, you know, and then you want to you want to be stout on defensive side. You don't want people running, you know, running on you. The other night, you know, we did allow them to run and to pass, and that's that's tough when that's happening. They're they're dictating to you. I would say for most all the games that didn't happen. We gave up some chunk runs or here or there, but 
you know, we weren't getting just like, man, they're getting five, seven, six, a carry and all that stuff. So nothing's going to change from a standpoint of we still have to be good up front. I just firmly believe nothing has convinced me different, and then we'll fill in around that um, to help us give us the best team we can. And, and But at the end, of, you, you kind of answered the way I would have answered at the end. You have to – you know, your best players have to make – the plays in the biggest moments of those games. Your best players have to play well when you're playing for a chance to go to the AFC Championship or a chance to get in the playoffs, all that. And we had a lot of players that played well. But it's, again, it's a play here, a play there is the difference in losing by three points or us still playing this week. Brandon, Brandon with the linebacker depth breaking down the way that it did uh, in the playoffs there, what held you guys back from not giving Dorian yeah, I mean, I think let's just let's go back to, um, and this is how I would answer it. This might not be how Sean would answer it, but um, a year ago we played at the Jets and Matt Milano was hurt and Terrell Bernard played the wheel spot for him. And he played a little bit like a rookie. And I talked to Terrell this offseason season in OTAs or sometime in May or June. And I was like, how do you feel now? And he's like, I feel unbelievably different than I did back even in the season, much less when he got here the prior year. Just an NFL defense, the volume of it, all the intricacies of, of what we try and do. And Dorian is a fast, explosive player. You want to make sure if – but if he's – thinking or, or is still learning nuances of the defense. And you got to remember, maybe we did him a disservice, maybe we didn't, but we did give him a lot of reps at, at middle linebacker this offseason when he got here, just trying to uh, give everybody opportunities to see what our best fits were there. And then we finally decided at some point in August, you know what, let's just, let's just leave him here. Let's cut half of that out. And – so I think when he comes back next year, he's just using Terrell as a, as a test case there, he's going to be a lot more knowledgeable, a lot more comfortable. The game is going to slow down for him. And so he, he is a fast, explosive player. I think Sean and, and, and Bobby Babbage decided that the best thing was to do was to give him certain assignments in games, certain packages, and that way he can play to his strengths. and. Because if you're not diagnosing it as quick because you're still figuring it out, I mean, the defense he played in at Tulane versus the defense here is this thick to this thick. A few minutes ago, just for a clarification in your question to Matt, you said there was no reason to make a change with what you've seen from Sean. Does that make a change as in a new coach, or does that make a change to <laughs> the, the structure of him calling the plays? No, the structure of him calling the plays or how we are set up on defense. And, and just as a broader note, like just because you came in after Sean, you know, uh, six playoffs in seven years, I mean, there's, there's been success here, <coughs> accomplishments. If there were to be a time where a change was needed, what would that look like just because of, you know, the structure? Mm -hmm. um, well, we both report to Terry separately. And so uh, that would ultimately be Terry and, and, and his call, how he – whether he thought I was doing a good job or not a good enough job, or and that goes for Sean. And how would you? How do you? How do you evaluate the head coach in your role? Um, well, if Terry asked me any questions, um, you know, we we would talk about it, or we we talk about everything. And there are times that you know all three of us are sitting down and, and evaluating what's going well with a play, you know, a player's skill set, um, how this side of the ball is doing, um, how it you know, particular coaches doing any of those things. So we're constantly having conversations. Um, but ultimately, the setup here is that I report to Terry and Sean reports to Terry. The three of us work together and collaborate, you know, on, you know, on the major decisions that we have to be, you know, that have to be made. So how do you evaluate Josh's season? Josh, oh, man. Um, I think Josh really, I'm going to start at the end here, Maddie, for you, but I thought down the stretch played some really, really strong football for us. And 
was a big reason that we went on the run we did to win the division and, and have a couple home playoff games. You know, I think earlier in the year, you know, probably some turnovers that he would be the first to tell you he, he would want to, you know, lessen some of those. Um, but, you know, he's – his work habits just continue to like he just he wants it like he's just he's learned the game he's super competitive you know he's looking for that that inch uh to help us beat the chiefs beat the Bengals, beat the ray whoever you know we gotta you know beat the dolphins to to secure the division um overall i thought very good i thought he uh, he made some big plays with his legs especially down the stretch and um, you know, we, as long as he's smart about that, we, you know, we don't want to take that away from him. It, it kind of gets him going. Um, I would, if you were going to say anything negative, I would just say early in the season, probably um, some turnovers that, that he, and he knows that, that, that we'd like to get corrected. But overall, um, I mean, he played his heart out the other night and he was trying to will this team himself. I mentioned a couple others, but he, he was refusing to lose, and, and I think he, you know, even after the game talking to him, I don't think he had rationalized that we lost the game. And he was just like, this, this, you know, we, we, we were right there. Tell me we didn't lose this game. Brandon, can you give us an update on both Damian Harris and Naeem Hines? Um, Damian, we'll start with him. You know, he just felt after the, you know, the, the neck deal he had, concussion, that um, – you know, it was best, you know, to shut him down. And so he's he's close to being ready to re, to return. I think he'll be healthy for free agency, um, you know, this offseason, whether he signed back here or, or signed somewhere else. Um, Naheem is still – he had that surgery um, early August, so he's, he's still working on his rehab. And I don't have, like, a timeline to say he's, he's going to be cleared, but – you know, I would see him being cleared by training camp. I'm not a doctor, and I haven't gotten that clarity, but just knowing when he did it, um, you know, I don't know what his participation would be like in, you know, OTAs yet. You would see him as part of the team going forward here? Yes. I'm sure Sunday didn't go the way at all the one that it to go, but after he signed his new contract, he said he was going to outplay it, um, you know, I'm sure that's something that you would like to hear. What, what did you take from this past season from Ed? Yeah, I, th I would say Ed has just continued to mature. And, and um, I truly thought a year ago he had the best training camp uh, of any player at St. John Fisher and back here. And that ankle at the Rams, I think it, you know, it, it set him back. And I don't – I know when I talked to him – but even before we signed him, the last offseason, when I talked to him, he said he was, even the season was over, he was still having to do stuff with his ankle. You know, he likes to be outside, you know, carrying hay bales and everything else thing he's doing. But it was still bothering him, he said, until late February when he finally stopped feeling it when he did anything physical. So, yes, he played through it, but I do think it bothered him. I thought this year he came back with a purpose. He's a competitive dude anyway. Uh, much less the naysayers. And, you know, I hope you guys doubt him again. I'd like for you to say he's overpaid or whatever, if you could write some of those articles again. Uh, that <laughs> He doesn't need that, but uh, I needled him about it for sure. Brandon, are, are you, you – Still in uh, a place where you're comfortable with Von Miller's legal situation, and where do you view that going into the offseason? We don't have any more information. It's kind of um, everything that we got at the time is, uh, is status quo. Yes, I would – I'm led to believe, um, you know, by the people that would know that this will, you know, there will be some type of finality this, this spring to, to wherever it is. Um, I, don't, I don't have, like, a recent update or anything like that, but nothing has changed from that standpoint to make us think any different of, of what we believe occurred. Brandon, are you are you confident that rest uh, alone will be sufficient for Josh's shoulder uh, this offseason? Yes. What will be a top priority for you going into this offseason? Um, top priorities would be build this roster with as you know 
many good players as we can. And that's, that's my number one job is we have to be, use every asset, everything we can. Obviously, I'm going to have to be creative with, with the cap. And, um, you know, I think, I don't think I need to say it, but I don't think you're going to see any splashes. Even if I found something that was exciting me, I don't think it would fit uh, within our cap parameters. And so I think everyone needs to understand that we're going to be shopping um, some of those same stores we were shopping last year. And um, we're not going to be on the main street of New York City or what, you know, whatever those main, where all those high end shopping centers are. It's just, it's not feasible um, to where we're at. But we're going to use every resource we can and um, we'll find a way to make a, another competitive roster in hopes that next year, this week, I'm not here, that we're still preparing, you know, for an AFC championship and, and beyond. Brandon, have you talked to Tyler? Um, I know that Sean said he's got full confidence in him, but just yeah. from like a you know human standpoint, he even because I'm sure you know, I saw it deactivated your social media. It's going to be a pretty rough days from him. Where's your status on that? And just have you had conversations with him? Yeah, um, you know, I gave him a hug after the game, and and just told him, you know, listen, I know he wants that kick back more than anybody, and. Um, He's done a lot of good things. He's won games. He's tied games. He's made big kicks for us. And one kick doesn't change how I view him, how we view him, his teammates view him. I think you saw many guys walk up to him, you know, either on the field or, or in the locker room. Uh, I don't think there's a player or staff member that I've heard that doubts Tyler Bass. Um, he did come up and uh, he saw me yesterday. We had a nice closed door conversation. And if he could change anything, it would be that we're still playing so he could go back out there and redeem himself. And, you know, I hate that that's the kick he's got to, you know, live with for, you know, he can't, there's no, there's no games until next September. Um, he is a relentless worker. It means a lot to him, you know. And, you know, I would hope that, you know, fans or whoever, if, if someone's giving him a hard time that would, take his career and take how hard he works and how much his teammates in this organization believes in him. And, and he's going to be a big part of what we're doing going forward. Um, there's no wavering of support in this building um, or definitely from Sean or myself. Now, is there any moves? I know we talked about the players wanting to play his back. Now, is there any moves that you feel that you would want to have back this season? Me? I mean, I don't – listen, he, there's always things you say – Maybe you could have done this. Maybe you could have done that. But um, I would be singling out a, a player or players if I said I didn't, I shouldn't have drafted this guy or I shouldn't have signed this guy. Um, you're always learning, and I'm going to try to be better next off season than I was this off season, and that's probably the best I can explain it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.